if the government is bad and super efficient or absent altogether, then the mafia might be more efficient than unregulated chaos. And yeah, it's like milking a cow. You don't kill the cow. You just milk it. Kidnapping is a business, but most people think of it as, as just a crime. Right. And I think that's what interest me. I think that's what interested me the most about this kidnap for ransom thing is that it's almost like a self-regulating industry as opposed to a random crime that happens to unlucky people. The thing that really interested me about kidnapping and hijacking for ransom was how well ordered it was. I thought of it as as, as a random thing, a one off thing, something that where you paired with somebody not of your choosing, you know absolutely nothing about them, and you're supposed to do a deal over somebody's life. And I thought, well, that's never going to work. And then I found out that, A, yes, actually it works a lot of the time. And interestingly, if you're insured for it, it goes right almost all of the time. And I thought, how can you possibly insure for something that is so random and so criminal? And that's got me that got me researching into the uh, economics of kidnapping. How many people are kidnapped every year for ransom? Because it doesn't seem like the kind of thing we hear a lot about, but maybe that's by design as well. That's absolutely right. So there are probably tens of thousands of people who get kidnapped every year. Most of them we don't hear about because it's part of a local economy. It's you, you kidnap somebody to get the ear of a local politician. You kidnap somebody to um, back up an extortion demand. That kind of local and local kidnapping we mostly don't hear about. Um, what I was interested in were the uh, transnational kidnaps, and we might hear about a few dozen of them, but they're probably a few hundred every year. Wow. That's a lot more than people think. And that's a little bit scarier, too. It makes you rethink your trip to Venezuela or, or Iran. A little off the beaten path. I, actually, where do most of the kidnappings happen? Maybe they're not even in those countries. Maybe they're in places that we think are actually a lot safer. Well, it changes over time. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So in uh, 2008 to 2013, uh, the big place was Somalia. Um, if you look at piracy at the moment, the, the hot spot is in, in, in the Gulf of Guinea. Um, there's lots of kidnapping in Nigeria. There is kidnapping in, in, in Mali. So Mexico has always been high for kidnapping. So, But it's, it can be very, very localised. So it's not the entire country, but it's a particular area, um, something that a kidnap for ransom insurer would call a, a complex and hostile territory. Mm -hmm. Logistically, it seems like a difficult business because you need to find a live hostage that is also valuable and then bring them somewhere that they don't want to go. You have to keep them there, keep them from escaping, but also keep them from dying in the process of whatever you're doing, wherever you're holding them, and, and make sure they don't kill themselves by mistake or on purpose. So there's got to be lots of lying and violence, and then, and then you have to get paid and somehow make a handoff also without getting caught or killed. Yes, that's something that I realized very early on, that kidnapping is easy and ransoming is extremely difficult. And that is also by design. If ransoming was easy, if people offered big ransoms very fast and just paid them in Bitcoin, then we'd all be getting kidnapped all of the time. Yeah, it's it's about making that transaction difficult enough to put it beyond the scope of, of, of an opportunistic kidnapper. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, make it work well enough that hostages come back alive. And that's a, that's a very fine balance here. How many people do come back alive? You know, it seems like I, we just have no concept. The big kidnappings you see that get in the news that make waves and their searches for months and things like that, it seems like usually there's not a happy ending to most of those. Yes, and that's a bias, a reporting bias by the media. So overall, people reckon that 90% that of people come back uh, alive. Um, however, if you've got kidnapped for ransom insurance, that goes up to 97.5%. So that's oh, wow. a really amazing result. And 
that's one of the reasons why people buy this kind of insurance, because it is actually the best way of fulfilling your duty of care towards your employees. If something happens, we have a very good plan on how we're going to extract live and hale and hearty hostages from, from these terrible scenarios. How, how long are people usually missing? Because, again, the ones you see about in the media, the person's gone for months or, or longer. Uh, is that the usual case with kidnapping or is there a quicker turnaround? Because it doesn't seem super profitable to hold somebody for two years. So, again, that very much depends on the country context. So different countries develop different kind of equilibria. So there are some countries where, where people are given back after five days for $10,000. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then if somebody wants to have a newsworthy $1 million, $2 million, $10 million ransom, then they really have to sit on the hostage, possibly for years. Oof. And you're saying exactly the right thing there. It doesn't look profitable. That's exactly the point. You know, if you want to have a $1 million ransom, they want you to spend most of that money on keeping that hostage alive and safe. In the meantime, um, you'll have to share that million dollar ransom with 100 people, at which point it's kind of not worth it anymore. And that's right. Um, I see. So that's that's set by those paying the ransom, which is like, okay, if you want a high ransom, we have to drag this out so that the next time you do this, you realize it's not worth it to negotiate for an extra 18 months to get an extra five hundred thousand dollars because you're just barely breaking even or or whatever. Uh, and in the meantime, you're worried you're going to die and you have to sleep in a hut next to this guy chained up in the middle of the desert because you got to make sure he doesn't escape. So the idea is to make it cheaper and faster, but mostly at the same time, not cheaper and also expensive, because otherwise, like you said, we'd all be getting kidnapped. So you, you almost have to, again, self-regulate. And we'll talk about how this works a little bit. Uh, it seems like there's a yeah, lot of the, the, the plan here is to make it unattractive to kidnap in the first place. So right, that makes people sense. think twice about, is, is this really the business I want to be in? Um, if you don't have that sophistication, if you don't have the jungle camp already set up, if you don't control the territory where the police never goes, you don't want to be in this business. So as I said, it's a really fine balance. On the one hand, you want to bring back live hostages, but on the other hand, you don't want to paint that bullseye target on every white corporate face that shows shows up in, in, in a particular kidnapping hotspot. You want people to think, I'd rather drive a taxi. Right, yeah. No, that, that completely makes sense. Yeah, you don't want to... Make, you, you don't want people to get rich off of this quickly. You want the kidnappers to work and take a long time to get the money so that, like you said, taxi drivers aren't going into kidnapping because it's so lucrative. They just say, you know what? I make a similar amount ROI driving a taxi for two years, and I'm not going to get shot by the police if this goes wrong. Uh, and and also the, the people who are transporting goods or traveling, they don't need armed guards on every boat or in every car that's driving around doing business. So... Th- it becomes profitable, but only just a little, such that really only hardened criminals are doing this and they're almost better off getting a regular job. Indeed. And if you're dealing with a criminal organization or often a rebel organization, an insurgency, then you are in a repeated game. Yeah. So at that point, you can think about how can you make reputational solutions work? How can you create order in what is a very potentially very chaotic and extremely emotional situation if you're dealing with people who want to do this again then you can discipline them and you can say well this is not how we do business and you don't go back on your word and you don't torture hostages and it's about training your adversary about what the rules of the game are Right. Okay. So if I'm dealing with FARC in Colombia in the 80s, who's kidnapping, I don't know, a dozen people a month or whatever it is, I can regulate their behavior by not rewarding it economically. So if they if they send me an ear, I say, okay, well, now we have to do all this paperwork over here and we have to reevaluate and you've changed the game. So we'll talk in 30 days 
you know, and we have to make sure that the hostage is okay. So now we have to send some medical supplies and we need to make sure that he gets. So it's just such a huge pain that they go, okay, no more ears, guys. That blew up in our face. That's not a good idea. What we need to do is make sure these guys are well fed and they're playing solitaire or cards in a jungle cell and not bleeding to death. And we're, we don't need blood transfusions in the middle of the jungle because they want to, this is like you said, a continual thing. It's like selling donuts. You don't sell somebody a donut with a rat tail in it if you want them to come back to your donut shop. You have to sell them good donuts at a good price. And so kidnapping becomes one of those almost like a commodity, like a, a, a good that has to be in good shape. You have to have good business practice. You need those five-star Yelp reviews for your jungle prison. Yeah, alternatively, you don't necessarily have to go through the entire business of kidnapping because once you've proved that you can kidnap people and that you can keep them for a long period of time, then it might also become interesting for a company that is located in or close to FARC territory to come to some sort of arrangement about the ways in which the local community might tolerate the presence of, say, an oil company. Okay, so instead of kidnapping executives, you say, every executive needs this special pass that we give you, and the way you get that is you pay us $2,000 a month for every white face we see roaming around here in a nice car. And if they don't have it, Something might happen to them. They might get pulled over, and then we're going to have to deal with it then. But if you pay up front, we're good. That kind of thing. So extortion, basically. Yes. So I, I see kidnapping as something where a protection contract has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in equilibrium, I'd rather spare myself the unpleasantness of kidnapping you if you're prepared to pay me not to kidnap you. And if I can collect money from a lot of people, that makes me better off than actually kidnapping people all the time. Um, it's not going to be quite as easy as sending a check to FARC headquarters every month <laughs> because clearly the national government ha might have something to say about that. So a lot of these protection contracts are much more implicit in the sense of um, these are the restaurants you go to, these are the hotels you use, um, these people will be providing your security. Um, here are some nice nannies and gardeners. Really? Oh, I see. So essentially, we're hiring their village and their family to work for our company. And in that respect, we're, it's like this is like Game of Thrones or something, right? Like you're bound by marriage and like you're. Your, so if you're a company that's in these areas, if you if all your local staff is, is in these villages that are controlled by FARC, you're generating revenue for them. And maybe those people are kicking up. So you don't have to. Yeah, they don't have your Amex on auto draft or whatever. That's right. But you might decide that it would be a really good idea to have a very sound corporate social responsibility program in place that creates a constant stream of revenue that can be conveniently interrupted if something should go wrong with a protection relationship, i.e. somebody's getting kidnapped and you want to ask questions about whether people are still cool about you being there. Right, so we might build a hospital and a school staffed with all locals, and if somebody gets kidnapped, then we might have to, their paychecks might get frozen until we can straighten this whole big mess out, right? So then then the, the FARC or whoever we're dealing with, insurgent group, they start going, hey, who screwed up our our pretty good deal we had here with the hospital and the school? Now you're getting, you're maybe getting a payoff, but all these other people are getting the short end of the stick and you're making it almost politically painful for them at that point. Indeed, yes. So Interesting. kidnap insurance is almost all about creating effective protection, making sure that on the one hand, the people who go into these territories don't make themselves vulnerable to, to the opportunistic kidnap because with an opportunist, the taxi driver that just goes rogue, things are likely to go wrong because they don't know the rules, they don't know what they're doing, they're nervous, they might just shoot. And that's right. not what anybody wants. So if you do go into, into a difficult place, as an employee of a company, then you, you would get quite a lot of training about how do you move, how do you plan your route, how do you plan a different route every day, um, make sure you're in the fourth floor of the hotel and not on the ground floor. Lots of really easy ideas that nonetheless make it very difficult 
for, for somebody to just pick you off the street. Oh, interesting. So if I get kidnap insurance, I actually get some training on keeping amateurs away from me. That's right. And then we only have to deal with the top end. And with the top end, if something goes wrong, we have a plan. But ideally, it doesn't go wrong because they understand that they want us there. Right. Okay. That this this is all starting to make sense. A friend of mine got kidnapped in Colombia. He just told me the story yesterday, and it wasn't recent. But um, he got kidnapped by, like you said, a taxi that went rogue. But the problem was these guys were idiots and amateurs, and they were originally taking him on an express kidnapping where they take you to an ATM and they make you dump your money, and then they keep you till past midnight and give you a beer, and then they take you back out because your limits are reset. You run your cards again, and then they drop you off somewhere near where you can walk back without getting killed, hopefully, uh, to your hotel. And then somehow his phone or they got they got wind that he had like an IRA, a retirement account in the, here in the United States, and it had like 50 grand in it. And they were like, oh, you have all this money. And he's like, I can't get all that money to you at once. It's not like something I can pull out with my card. And they're like, well, you have to call your parents. And he, he's trying to explain to them, you can't just get an IRA to send money to this and it's going to take several days and blah, blah, blah. And they didn't understand that because this was like an amateur group of drunk, idiot, almost like young kids, but uh, a gang nonetheless that did this professionally. And he got rescued by the Colombian special forces. So and, and the guys were surprised because they say this doesn't really happen anymore, you know. Usually you go to an ATM, they dump you off, and we just, you, maybe you file a report, maybe not, maybe you don't even bother, you just go back home to Germany or whatever. And this was particularly dangerous because these guys were drunk, high, armed, and they didn't really have a plan. It seemed like every guy that came in to talk to him said, you know, we're going to kill you. And the other guy's like, we're not going to kill you. We're going to wait like three days and get a bunch of money. And the other guy would say, no, 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 we're waiting for your parents to wire us money. And he's like, oh, crap, I'm going to die because these guys don't know what the hell they're doing or what they want. Yeah, the, the express kidnap is exactly the response of a, a rational opportunist who who has done the deed and has kidnapped somebody and then says, and now what? And they might call somebody. If insurance is involved, the insurance will coach the family on how to deal with this. And really... The main response is exactly what happened to your friend. You stall. You just stall and say, okay, well, you you, you can have like $500, you can have $1,000 now, but what what do you expect us to do? Um, all our money is tied up. We're mortgaged up to here. We're, we won't be able... There is snow on the ground. We're not going to be able to get to the bank before Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, all of these things that, that say this is going to be difficult. You can have a very small amount of money now, but if you want anything more than that, then you've got to wait for at least a week. And it's all designed around making the opportunist realize that they've bitten off more than they can chew. You discussed something called protection theory and how this controls the industry, and we just sort of touched on this a little, but it limits violence as well to avoid making people flee, which erodes your tax base. So if I'm an insurgent group, I don't necessarily just want to kill everybody that's doing business in my area and take their money. Can you speak to how the mafia has and organized groups have figured out how to skim without bleeding everybody dry? Protection theory says that there are a lot of spaces on this planet where the state just does not project power. And yet people have a desperate need for their property rights to be protected, for their families to, to, to be safe, for their investments to be safe, for trade to be ordered, that there's somebody you can call if something goes wrong and they will adjudicate your disputes, they will make sure that your trade partners come up with either the money or the goods. So if there is no state, then people usually come up with grassroots solutions. Yeah, and it, it could be a, a, a religious court. It could be it could be a, a, a religious a, a, a temple militia. Um, hmm. It it could be it can be a rebel group. It can be an insurgent group. It could be people who say, "Well, we would do this much better than the local than, than the than the government over in uh, in, in, in Mogadishu." Here, we're better off 
just listening to what our elders say. Yeah, so it can be a tribal system, it can be a clan system. Lots of countries have come up with different ideas of how best to regulate the local economy. So these groups are there. Some of them are mm -hmm. armed and some of them are not. All of them have a credible threat of employing violence if people don't keep to the rules. Yeah, so if a foreign company becomes interested in doing something in that area, they will probably have to make some sort of deal, which is effectively a protection deal with the central government. But they will also have to say, OK, how are we going to keep the local people on board, that they're happy with us? I mean, there, there are certain things that you could possibly protect and have really good perimeter security around. But if ever you're thinking about producing something and exporting it through a pipeline, yeah. then you definitely need to have everybody along that pipeline happy with the presence of that pipeline in their territory and they need to protect it and you need to encourage them to protect it. But you also have to make, as I said, a protection contract that doesn't make your uh, shareholders or an investigative journalist sit up and, and, and say, they're paying extortion money. Right, right. So the, the, the mafia, and we'll just say mafia, even if it's a militia or, like you said, a, another type of group. So the mafia, it's not just violence and theft. They're actually providing services to the market in places with would you say failed government or failed rule of law, like either a mafia controlled or failed state like Somalia or a, a wide swath of jungle where the government and authorities don't quite reach into, like what the FARC was controlling? They're providing services there that maybe just they're just filling a power vacuum almost. That's exactly the idea. And the original mafia in Sicily was about a place where people were suddenly presented with lots of opportunities in terms of property rights. Um, because uh, church land and was, was was sold off and nobody to protect it. And then they said, well, who, who are the strong people around here who can make sure that nobody gets into my orange grove, etc." So that's where the sort of demand for protection comes from. You need, then need somebody who's trained in violence, who's willing to protect instead of, producing themselves so they obviously have to make some money from this so that's that's the argument of protection theory that once you start getting into the nitty-gritty details of how trading actually works you find that there are lots and lots of sandpaper moments where it's good if there is somebody you can call and um if it's not the police, because the entire island of Sicily has got 15 carabinieri on it, <laughs> then you need a local solution. Um, if you are of an ethnic minority that receives no protection and a lot of bias from the central government, then you also need to do your own thing. Um, if the, a different tribe is in power and they don't like your tribe, you need to find your own solutions. This is such an interesting aside here because I lived in Ukraine a long time ago in like 2002 or maybe even earlier. And I one of the I met an American there who was just kind of like a I'll just, a drunk. I'll just put it that way. He was a drunk who hung out with the mafia guys and he was an English teacher. But he was kind of like those a guy whose life probably didn't go super well in the United States. And he's like, I'm going to move to Ukraine. Right. So one thing that he told me was don't ever talk to the police. Pretend you don't understand what they're saying. Never get in the car. And if they try and force you in the car, just run. They're not going to, like, shoot you. And I thought, that's, that is crazy. I would never do that in the United States. And he's like, trust me, don't get in the car. So a friend of mine, he, uh, I tell him the same thing. And he's like, dude, I'm not doing that. I, the police yelled at me the other day because they, they're outside the place where I'm staying. I'm not doing that. I don't want to get in trouble. So he got into a police car. And a couple of days later when I saw him, he goes, you were totally right about the police. They made me get in the car. I explained that I didn't really understand what was going on, and they just robbed me and took all my money, and then they m made me get out of the car and, like, walk, and now they're always asking me for money, and they're always following me around, and they know where I'm staying, so I have to move. And I thought, wow, this is, a re this is really bad. So 
So I talked to my friend, the English teacher, who was a drunk, and he goes, oh, you need to meet a few people. And so he introduces me to these other kind of like punk drunk mafia kids. And they're like, if you have any problems, call the number on your mobile phone that I give you on this card and just pass the phone to the police. And I said, uh, okay, you're not messing with me. This isn't going to get me like shot in the back of the car or dumped somewhere. And he's like, no, trust me. So I gave that card to a fr the friend who kept getting in trouble. And he goes, I didn't even have to call the number. As soon as the policeman looked at the card and saw the handwriting with the number on it, he just immediately left me alone because probably there's a very limited number of people who write down a phone number on the back of a card of, of a whatever barber shop or whatever the hell this card was for and say, show this to the cops. It's like, if you have the guts to call, to show that to the cop, they don't need to double check the number or make a call. Like you're talking to the right people. And so I thought that was very interesting because yes, we talked about a power vacuum when the state has failed, but this is where the state it hasn't failed and there are police, they're just worse than criminals or they are on a different criminal gang that is on a lower tier. So if you're dealing with the higher tier mafiosi, the lower tier criminals, AKA the police, they won't mess with you, which was to me kind of backwards and fascinating coming from the United States. I, I agree, but clearly the police have failed in their job of protecting, of providing genuine and meaningful protection to people. What what I like, again, is, is that, that non-violence of this, that there are certain things that you don't need to test because the threat is credible. Whatever these uh, guys had done previously had signaled to the police that it was better for them to back off. And, um, yeah, a super interesting if the government is bad and super efficient or absent altogether, then the mafia might be more efficient than unregulated chaos. And yeah, it's like milking a cow. You don't kill the cow. You just milk it, even if it's a little bit, I suppose, unhealthy at that point. It's like an, an inefficient externality in the economy. It's less efficient, but it's not so inefficient that everybody's out of business because otherwise, again, that long term view of business is, hey, you should only extort to where the person can still survive. Otherwise, they'll just stop working because there's no reason for them to continue. That's right. Yeah, people won't invest. People won't specialize. I mean, there, there are places where you don't have protection and they make you cry because the only thing that you can grow is something that's called bitter cassava. And this is a, a, a tuber that lives a long way down in the ground. So even if somebody comes and raises everything to the ground and burns your fields, the tuber is still there. You can, it's backbreaking labor to get it out of the ground. Um, then you spend hours trying to peel it. Um, you have to, to then grind it down. Then you have to water it, dry it, grind it some more, water it, grind it. It takes like 18 hours to make a meal from it. That's what you eat when you don't have anybody protecting you. That's yeah. horrible. That's it is absolutely horrible. And it makes you go blind as well. But it's that's why people look for someone to protect them. That's why they don't want to be in that roving militia type of scenario. Um, but yeah, if you if you want goats, if you want fields, if you want coffee trees that take five or ten years to become productive. You need to be sure that when they are bearing fruit, you're still going to be there to benefit from it. So it is about these long run reputational trust relationships. Going back to kidnapping, why would a wealthy company that could self-insure still end up buying insurance? You know, why does a $50 billion shipping company buy $2 million dollars? worth of kidnap insurance. Is it because of these other services, the negotiation and what else you get with it? Is that why? Yes. So there, there, there are two aspects here. There are some things that are just done extremely well by professionals. And if you don't do them by the book, you might fail. And if you fail in retrieving a live hostage, then you're also very likely to be sued by the family um, of that hostage afterwards for not having done your duty of care mm. properly. And what kidnap insurers have done is, is to create, um, yeah, the, the code book for best practice. 
And if you were taken to court about a kidnap gone wrong and you haven't had kidnap insurance or you didn't follow the advice of your kidnap insurer or the crisis responder, then you'd likely be hit extremely hard for failing in your duty of care. So it's sold very much as a duty of care product rather than a you can take it or leave it kind of insurance. Who sells this? I, I know that there's a lot of insurance companies that insure things like the fingers of a guitarist or the vocal cords of a singer, uh, the knee of a basketball player. Is that the same kind of outfit that would sell those types of insurance? These sort of only one person or 10 people in the world have it kind of thing? Well, it so happens that it is only very few insurance companies that sell this. And they are closely related to the ones that, that cover these special risks. Um, it's, a, it's something that happens relatively rarely. Um, but if it happens, even if the ransoms aren't very high, there is a lot of cost associated with, with, with doing this properly, um, with, with paying for, for, for the best possible advice, for making sure that every part of the transaction runs smoothly. So resolving a kidnap case is, is, is quite expensive. So it's what insurers call a concentrated risk. So this is not something that lots of insurers want to have a little bit of the market off. Yeah, so it's 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 better for all of these risks to be pooled um, with a smaller number of insurance companies. And that's one of the, or probably the reason um, that the market for insurance and that the norms around the resolution protocols and the discipline around ransoms have held so well that these insurance companies, there's 20 of them, but three or four who have the biggest market share, um, they can discipline each other. Yeah, you can you can see how it might be quite tempting to jump the gun and say, I want my husband back now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> rather than in three months time. And I'm quite happy personally, to spend an extra $50,000 for that. That's fine, except it completely ruins everybody else's chances of having a nice holiday or, or, or a safe business venture in that particular location. Right, because you're raising the amount that kidnappers think they can get. So if, if I'm if I'm a rich guy and my wife gets kidnapped, I'm like, I don't care. I'll pay them one hundred thousand dollars if they send her back tomorrow. Just do it. And then the next person who can't afford that by any stretch gets kidnapped. They're like, well, wait, it's not thirty thousand dollars to get someone back anymore. It's one hundred thousand dollars because that's what we got last time. So now I've distorted the market by overpaying because my demand, my love, my sort of tolerance for the cost and the level of demand was artificially high for that one instance. Absolutely right. Yeah, criminal communities talk. And if they think that they've somehow made a mistake with the original ransom level and they can get a lot more, then they will try to get a lot more. A really good example of that is Somali piracy. Um, there's always been Somali piracy. Um, the, 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 the British Navy went out in the 19th century to deal with Somali pirates. Oh, so the yeah, narrative so that it's is, all because it's, it's of always, overfishing is nonsense? Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's a red herring, I'd say. Yeah, nice pun. Um, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> sure. Um, but so every year, about six, seven, eight, nine ships went missing um, off the coast of Somalia, and they always went home after three months for $100,000. That was just the way business was done. And it was completely stable. And then somebody said, oh, I'm not sure about three months. I just want my guys back now. I'm quite happily pay you a million. Mm. And then they thought, well, what's going on here? Did we just get this wrong? What's the real price for a Spanish fishing vessel? What is the real price for, 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 for an oil tanker or a chemical tank, tanker? How much do the people want their, their crews back? And um, so they started pushing for more. And the, the ship owner said, 
Okay, well, you know you've got a release after three months because the onboard supplies will run out. And then the Somali said, no, we don't have to give them back. We can make our own supply lines from the land. So you get this standoff between the ship owners and the insurers who want to push this into the into the long grass. And the Somali said, we got the long grass covered. So you get bigger ransoms longer detention periods, more violence because they, they, they try and push with threats, with mock executions, etc. See if somebody gets nervous, somebody gets nervous. Ransoms go up to 2 million, to 3 million, to 5 million. Yeah, that, getting that genie back into the bottle just doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, so in the end, in the end, you had to have that big naval operation. You had to make sure that Basically, Somali piracy didn't succeed anymore, and and then it became insurable again. I see. Yeah, a guy that was on this show, episode 115, Michael Scott Moore is his name. We'll run the trailer at the end of the show here. He was, I don't know if you've heard about this guy, he was kidnapped by Somali pirates and kept on a ship for, I want to say it was like two years. And they had executed the Taiwanese captain of the ship, and people had died from, like, dysentery, and they were just skin and bones, and the kidnappers were juiced to the gills on cat, which is like this stimulant sort of cheap stimulant substitute that's highly addictive. And they got super sick. I mean, he just almost died there because they were not going to give him back. They wanted some insane amount of money. And uh, it turned out later that the government actually knew where he was the whole time, but they just can't go in with Navy SEALs and rescue every hostage, especially uh, when they're on a boat like that. So he stayed there. It was, it's a kind of a horrible experience in story, if you think about it, because while we're talking about economics, there's still somebody in a ship who doesn't have their diabetes insulin or their glasses or both and is possibly dying because we're dragging this out so that the next guy who gets kidnapped actually has a better chance at survival. It's a little bit, it's a tough pill to swallow. I think I want to unpack that slightly. Um, the, the idea that you can make the problem go away by throwing money at it, by just conceding to a, a huge demand, it might work. But on the other hand, if you just say, OK, I'm quite, I quite, you only asked for 50,000, I'm quite happily giving you 100,000 to give me my treasure back. It's not a price. It's not like you can walk out with a hostage out, of, like out of a supermarket. Yeah, right. If if you, if you, if you are with an opportunist who, who who's well out of their depth, they might concede. But if you are with a professional kidnapping outfit, you've just revealed that a hundred thousand dollars is easy money for you, and they will not say, yes, thank you, Mr. Jordan, they <laughs> will say, how about 200,000? And you say, yeah, that's fine too. And you say, well, how about half a million then? And you say, oh yeah, I can do that. And then they say, what, what about a million? And you say, hmm, that would be more difficult. Yeah, but these prices can go the other way. Yeah, so just by conceding, it doesn't mean that your hostage is safe and is coming back. You might right. just have reset the game because they price discriminate. Yeah, I'm not against the method. I'm just saying at the other end, there's a human and it really sucks for them no matter what. Because even if they are there for a week and everything runs smoothly, yeah, that's the best case scenario. But uh, it, it's, it is a little bit rough when I think he got passed around to multiple groups if memory serves. Because maybe the first guys were like, we don't even know if we can keep this guy alive. It's been a long time. The ship is sinking slowly. And then I think they put him in a land-based thing. And it was just a totally different gang, you know, who treated him even worse. And you're right. So having this done professionally is actually better, even if you... I'd rather be in a cell where I'm getting fed than a hut in the middle of nowhere where I'm chained to the ground and not getting fed, you know, which is like kind of what his situation was. Um in in general, the, the the idea of this professionalization of of, of ransom negotiation and, and and crisis response is is exactly for things not to get out of hand, but for there to be an expectation about this is a five day thing, completely non violent, and it ends with a thirty thousand dollar ransom, and everything kind of becomes almost theatrical. 
about the ransom negotiation. Yeah, so so the the, the Somali example is is something that shows you how easily an equilibrium like that gets disturbed. But it tells you also how difficult it is to establish a new equilibrium with which everybody can live. And, and in, in Somalia, that didn't happen. But yeah, the Somali case and these ever-extending, ever more violent um, negotiations and, 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 and resolutions is exactly what we're trying to avoid by clamping down on that first opportunist who starts to think kidnapping is easy. You tell them, no, it's not easy. It's going to be really, really difficult unless you've got everything in place. You better not do it. So patience and slow negotiations actually end up lowering the final hostage price, right? Because they're, they're, is the insurer trying to, to drag it out in terms of time or is it more just resistance to negotiation? It seems like time is really what's unfortunately on the side of the negotiator. Like the family wants the guy back quick, but the insurance company wants to stabilize the market, right? So there's a little bit of a, I don't know, would you say competing interest? But it actually, it's still in the best interest of the hostage because they're not going to... Well, I don't know. Is it? Maybe you should answer that. I don't know. I'm going around in circles in my head here. It's very easy to go around in circles on on, on that. I, if you think that you could actually get the hostage back by paying more, then obviously it would be nice for the hostage not to be, um, not, not to spend the extra time in captivity. But as I said, by signaling to the uh, captors that you do have money, um, you probably make things worse for the hostage because even if the captors are not able to hold the hostage, they often have the chance of selling them on. Yeah, so a negotiation goes wrong when you say, oh, this is a million dollar hostage, but we're not million dollar cap <laughs> captors and hostage takers. Um, we're just a lowly militia who, we got to sell the hostage on, and and you you find that a lot. Yeah. So if you've got a million dollar hostage, somebody will probably buy them for for, for fifty thousand, and then they will sell them on for a hundred thousand. Um. If you look at the the path of various hostages uh, in, in in Syria, they've been traded multiple times. Yeah. So so there's nothing to say that the hostage will do better by saying, I'm a high-value hostage. Uh, quite the opposite. Daniel Levin was on this show a, a while ago, and he negotiates hostage release in Syria. It's one of the things that, that he does. I, I wouldn't say it's his job full-time, but he gets called on to do this quite a bit, episode 617. And he said that media will make things a lot harder because it, the first instinct is to like, go to the media, go to your senator and tell them what's going on and that they'll pull all the right levers. But what that does is it just drives hostage value up big time. And then either, like you said, they get sold off to a different group. It's suddenly Al Qaeda wants to know where this guy is rather than the two guys who kidnapped him in a fake, ta fake taxi. And they'll go and buy him or steal him from the amateurs. And now you're in bigger trouble because ISIS or Al Qaeda has you or something like that. And, and then also possibly the propaganda value of you as a hostage might outweigh any money they can get. Because if your ransom was 30,000 before, and then it becomes 100,000, well, maybe ISIS wants to make a video, unfortunately, of you meeting a, a disgusting end that they can put on CNN. And that might be worth more than $100,000 to them. And so now you're st you're sitting there until they can ascertain your real value, which might take months or years. And then as soon as they sense that your value is dropping below the propaganda value, then we end up with a horrible video that, you know, w we can't unsee. And and so that yeah. going to the media will distort this immediately. And it's, it's unfortunate because, of course, it's your first instinct is to get all the high level players you can involved in the release of your husband or your kid. But it's the worst thing you can do. Indeed, yeah. So the story that a crisis responder will tell the kidnapper is bad luck. You got the wrong guy. Yeah, you thought he was the chief executive. You got the chauffeur. Now, yeah? so it's all about managing expectations and convincing 
the, uh, the the kidnapper that that they've been that they've been unlucky. Um, yeah, if you blow that cover, then then all bets are off. Now there's there was an interesting story again with the Somalia, uh, with a ship called the the Leopard, where there were two Danish um, sailors who got kidnapped off that ship with a few other crew, and um, the. Uh, the, the negotiators did the right right job, and they they said they got into the press that the that the shipping company was struggling and wasn't wasn't really making any profits, um, really managing the expectations of the the Somali pirates that this was that they'd been unlucky and they just got a bad Danish ship, and then some bright investigative journalists came and uh, started taking photographs of the villa of the ship owner. Mm. Uh, saying, "Oh, this nasty man clearly doesn't care about his employees." And again, this is, this is one of those cases where, when, when you then suddenly, in a completely different scenario, where people are arguing about how much money you can possibly give to criminals. I mean, that's the other thing that people don't always really think about that. If you are giving your money to pirates, if you are giving your money to rebels, and especially if you're giving your money to Al Qaeda or, or, or ISIS, that's not going to be going into soup kitchens, or, or not a lot of it is going to go into soup kitchens. It's going to be creating misery and havoc for, for thousands of other people. And there's some moral issues around that, I'd say, too. Yeah, I, I can I can agree with you there. It is really tough, though, of course, when it's your loved one that is that is kidnapped. And I'm sure these journalists had the best intentions in mind, but really they need to coordinate this with the negotiator. I, I assume with a negotiator with an insurance company that the opening offer from or, or I should say the re first reply to the demand has to be high enough to mean that the hostage isn't worth just killing and dumping them, but keeping safe while also meeting a minimum price, right? Because you don't want to feed, you don't want to make it so that feeding the hostage and keeping them safe becomes a negative return. Uh, but you also don't want to make it so high that they think that they've got a, a, a lucky winner in their basement. Absolutely right. And, and that goes back to what I said earlier on. This is about a tight knit community of not very many insurers who, who sit at Lloyd's, who retain a number of crisis responders. Um, they are all connected. They all know each other. They can exchange information and they, say, they can say, have you talked to these guys before? Uh, who, who are they? Um, what are their tactics? What are their strategies? Um, what are their expectations? How much did you pay them last time? How did you pay them? How should you pay them the five times before? What is the going rate? Is there a shake we can talk to? to resolve this amicably without going down the ransoming route altogether. All that information is held within this tightly knit community. Yeah, this is interesting. So there's a bunch of cubicles at the in Lloyd's of London office or something like that or desks. And someone says, who's our Syria guy? Our, oh, hey, don't waste your time with these groups. They always say they have hostages. They're always lying. This is the guy who you need to talk to. He's a Hezbollah connected guy. He's way above all these guys. It'll save you months of time trying to find the right person. This guy won't. He hasn't lied to us before. So you almost get like the speed dial to the right person to get accurate information or get a proof of life or whatever you need to make sure the hostage is alive and in, in the place you think he is. Absolutely right. With a slight proviso that if a terrorist group is involved, which in Syria would be likely at the moment, um, all bets are off because then there is international law that says that uh, an insurance company cannot get involved in, in, in a ransom negotiation or in facilitating a ransom because it's illegal. Right. What do you do then? I mean, the, <laughs> do you just break the laws or some way around this? You need plausible deniability, I guess. Ooh. <laughs> very pragmatic. Um, well, one of the reasons we have seen all those horrors around ISIS hostages and Al-Qaeda hostages is exactly because you don't have the disciplining effect of um, these professional crisis responder, but you push this onto the desk of some bureaucrat who's never run a ransom negotiation before. And he's just told that the Italian prime minister wants 
these two nurses or charity workers back at whatever price is necessary. And that's, again, when you see this massive ransom inflation because the bureaucrats just don't know what they're doing and it's very difficult for them to say, oh, the Swiss government can't afford four million francs. Right, right. <laughs> yes, so all, all of that management of expectation around you were talking to uh, a, a, a family with credit card debts and, 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 and a higher purchase car. You can't tell that story if, if you've got a government at the end right. of the line. Right, this makes sense. So it's better for the kidnappers to think they're dealing with the family. Hey, look, this is a family. We don't have insurance. The oil company's not going to cover it. They don't care. So that keeps the ransom lower. And it's like, look, I can take my kid's college education money and give it to you, but that's literally all we have. We've already moved in with my mom. But yeah, if you're talking with Senator Carl Levin or something like that, it's going to be harder for him to say, look, we just don't have the cash. The United States, man, inflation. We can't get you that that money. Sorry, buddy. That's going to be impossible and, and not believable. Or, or even if you're just shell oil, you can't say we don't have the money or that's too expensive. You really have to play the part of we have no backing here. I'm just a negotiator doing these guys a favor. Uh, or I'm not even, a, maybe well, not, not a negotiator. Not, they just don't doing these even guys appear. They don't even appear. The negotiator sits in the background. You, you oh, get the, un see. the uncle to run the negotiation, ideally. And yeah, if you if you are Shell, then you've got a problem. But if you can say, well, yes, they're kind of working for Shell, except they're not quite with Shell, but they're some subsidiary. And the subsidiary is having an absolutely terrible time with Shell because they're not making any profits at all. In fact, they were about to fold anyway. So if you can push it down that line, that that, that also sometimes work. Or you can say, yes, maybe the big company does have um, insurance for its top level staff, but certainly not, not for the local staff. Yeah, so so it's 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 always about pushing it down, but that doesn't obviously doesn't work if if you're in that international terrorism United Nations embargo against terrorist finance kind of territory. And 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 then you know, a government can choose or not can choose to react or, or not react. And and then we have the scenario that you were describing earlier where it was more profitable for, for ISIS to kill Brits and Americans because every time they did so, the um, French and the Italians and the Swiss and the Danes doubled their offers. Mm -hmm. So you end up being the sacrificial lamb that shows that they mean business and they know that the U.S. won't negotiate with terrorists, so they just go, all right, these people are worth nothing alive so we might as well kill them to get everybody else's attention. So that's the first step is they just kill you. Yes. Yikes. That's yeah. exactly what, what, what happens. Not, not necessarily they have no value, but if you say, okay, American families, if they wish to rescue their loved ones, we won't stop them from doing a private deal. Then, then they're still in the tens of thousand dollar territory. But if you kill them gruesomely, you might raise somebody else's ransom by a million and then. Right. And you get a video out of the deal, right. For, for your website or whatever, if you're ISIS. Propaganda purposes. Right. But yeah, that's, that's the context of these propaganda videos that they're not negotiating as, as you would do in this crime scenario over individual hostages, but they're thinking of it. We now have a batch of hostages. How do we maximize the price of the batch of hostages? And if you kill some, overall profits might rise. So so that that was the problem. But as I said, that's a very specific case because it's 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 outside of that insurance thing, but but it shows you how well insurance works. Mm-hmm. Right. No, that makes sense. It's kind of a it's very fascinating the idea here, right? Because the, the insurers are acting in the interest of the market and, and not necessarily themselves at any given time. Right. They they would love to get a speedy resolution for their clients, but they know long term in a repeated game, they have to do this. So it's a, a fun juxtaposition, right? Because of one hand, we're arguing the kidnap business is like this healthy free market, even though it's a crime. And on the other hand, 
the insurance, which is legal, you have to regulate it like a cartel for it to work long term by sort of forcibly pushing prices down. If you were doing that with grain or something, you you would probably be in trouble. But it's almost like a loophole where they're like, well, it's criminals on one side and we're dealing with human lives. So we're maybe going to not enforce the rights of the kidnappers to charge as much as they want for human lives. And in this respect, private governance and the free market is better than governments negotiating this, because like you said, governments might want a speedy release, which is super expensive and then ends up funding terrorists and criminals at the end of the day. Yes, it's, it, you, you call it a cartel. I think what's what's interesting here is uh, it's, it's, it's a club. It's, it's set up as a club and it's a club where v- membership is valuable in the sense that if you're a member of the club, you can sell this insurance and you can do it well. And you can make a profit out of it, um, but you're you're right. We're we're, we're trying. We have, we have a club that regulates the price for hostages. It's driving the price for hostages down, um, which is exactly what you want. I mean, in 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 a way, ideally, in an ideal world, you'd have enough formal governance for kidnapping to become impossible. Mm-hmm. And yet here we are. We, <laughs> clearly, clearly we don't. We don't. Right. So what, what is the second best solution? The second best solution is that uh, we regulate the price of, insur- of, of, of ransoms so that we see very little kidnapping without spending any money on police enforcement. Do people who are insured for kidnapping know that they're insured? Because it might, you know, they say insurance can change your behavior in some ways. It's really interesting. Um, it's not something that you can buy in general. It has to be bought on your behalf. Um, if you know that you're insured and you tell your kidnapper you're insured, the insurance is invalidated. Oh, gosh. Don't make that mistake then. Oh, absolutely right. But that's, <laughs> that's exactly because we don't want people to sit with their kidnappers and say, I'm really valuable. I'm insured for a million. Yeah. That's that's the last thing you want to tell them, given that maybe the local price is at thirty thousand dollars. You don't want to give them the windfall. So whoever does that immediately loses their insurance. Which then makes it easier for the negotiators and the family to say, yes, we did have insurance, but unfortunately, because you told you were told that there was insurance, there no longer is insurance, and therefore we're back to square one. You're talking to a credit constrained right, family okay. that doesn't actually have any money. Right, this makes sense, because if, if they don't know that they're insured, then if the kidnapper says, I know he's got a $10 million insurance policy, then you go, well, I know that you don't know that, because even he doesn't know that. So you can't know that this Shell executive has it because he also doesn't have a clue. And by the way, I assume that as soon as you go into a really dangerous place as an executive from an oil company with kidnap insurance, they take you off the website, right? Because it would be a real shame if you say, listen, man, I'm just an administrative assistant. There's no big bosses in the country. And they Google you and they go, isn't that you at the top of this giant pyramid of people? And it says CEO or like regional head of business, Venezuela. Is this not you? And you're just like, damn it. Damn it, about page. You've done it again. Yeah, certainly websites disappear um, if they're unhelpful. Um, if you have uh, documented your aspirational lifestyle um, on Instagram, that might disappear quite quickly because they want to know about all those cars and girls and clubs yeah. and yachts, etc. Just pictures of you but shoveling the... snow in the freezing winter of Michigan. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> However, obviously with the CEO you would create wraparound security in such a way that it's impossible for anybody to take that person. Yeah, So you go with close protection and you make sure, as I said before, that there is local support for the CEO to be visiting. Yeah, So, so as I said, 99.9% of, of, of kidnap insurance is about making sure that it doesn't happen. That's plan A. We have a very cool plan B if it does happen, but we really don't want to go there. But if it happens, and as I said, it's very, very rare, considering that these are the most attractive targets on the planet. 
people working for financially high powered institutions, um, NGOs, Fortune 500 companies, etc. You, you'd think they would be the ones to get, and, and yet largely they're not. The insured have to raise the money themselves and then get reimbursed by the insurance company, correct? That's correct. Yes, that's Why another. Is that? Again, that makes it more difficult to be generous. So ultimately, I told you about crisis responders, and I said they help the family do the negotiation, but ultimately the family has to do the negotiation themselves. They make the final decisions. Nobody can take that decision away from you. All a negotiator, professional hostage negotiator can do is give you the best possible advice. Yeah, And they say, OK, this is going to be the phone call where we're going to get the threat with the ear. If you ignore that threat, we're not going to see an ear. If you reward bad behaviour by raising the amount of money that you're offering, then you're going to get a worse threat next time. So you make the decision. Right, I see. I see. Yeah. So, yeah. so people at any one time, and if you're an alpha male, you might be very well tempted to do your own thing. Um, anything can go wrong when 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 the people are actually on the phone to, 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 to the kidnappers decide that they want to do something different. And you just want to make a put 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 a limit in there and say, you've got to raise that money. Yeah. Do you really want to sell your house? Do you really want to sell your car? Do you really want to have a yard sale with all your furniture so you can raise this money? Yeah, I, I don't know how many alpha males there are when you're strapped to a chair in a basement somewhere. I think that whole thing goes away pretty quick. I would like to think uh, that it's not the hostage. It, oh, it's, that's true. It's, it's the negotiator, the, the, it's, right? It's it's the people who who are, who are doing the negotiation. And and as I said, I keep coming back to Somali piracy because we, you're talking about a ship owner who's very much used to being in charge. Sure. Now, yeah. I, being told by somebody else it would be a very good idea to do X or Y, and they may or may not listen to that. Right. Like, I run a big company. I don't need advice from some guy who just got out of the military and is half my age, buddy. Send a, send as many fingers as you want. I don't care. He's He, he doesn't do much typing anyway. Right. Um, What happens when you do actually get a finger or an ear in the mail? I mean, that that does happen from time to time, I assume, yeah? There are occasionally photos and there are occasionally um, pieces, body pieces. They're very, it's, it's worth doing a genetic test to make sure they actually belong to the person that you are missing. <laughs> I suppose you're right. That's a very, that's sort of a ridiculous, it reminds me of that movie, The Big Lebowski, where he says, I can get you a toe by 3 p.m. today with nail polish. Um, that's a reference that you might not get, but a lot of people listening definitely do. It's just such a ridiculous thing that they might send somebody else's finger, but I guess it's possible. Yeah, and if if, if you were in this business and you don't want to, you don't want to kill the hostage. Yeah, I mean, piece of a finger, you probably can manage the trauma and the possible infection, etc. But it is a risk. So, and generally, these threats are only acted upon if a previous threat has been successful. Yeah, so it's, it's negotiation strategy is about not rewarding bad behavior. And they, they don't generally start with cutting off bits. They start off with something, something less. And if you say, oh, please just stop it. I can't take it anymore. I'm going to double my offer. Then, then you go down that route of escalating the violence. But as we discussed before, if, 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 if you say, if you're threatening this kind of thing, I don't think I can really continue this conversation. Um, you need to stop whatever you're threatening to do or you're doing. And we, we need to, we, we, this is a business. Yeah, You want money, we want our hostage back. We're willing to give you as much as we possibly can, but we're struggling to raise the money. Yeah, you can you can see how that conversation can be, you know, dragged back to something that's that's cooperative, and about business, 
and, 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 and about money rather than about reacting positively to threats. I mean, any anyone who has a child knows that, that bad behaviour, if you reward bad behaviour, you're going to see more of it. Mm-hmm. Right. So you you bring the conversation back to the the logical dollars and cents as opposed to yelling and screaming and violence and react screaming and reaction to the violence and things like that. You, you give an example in the book where hostage takers pretend to cut off someone's finger and then they send the family a photo of this fake defingering. Why send a photo of a fake finger mutilation and not actually cut off the finger? Like, it seems kind of pointless to fake that. If you're not actually, they went through way more trouble making a fake finger mutilation than just simply cutting off the tip of this person's finger. I don't understand the logic there. Well, maybe because you're thinking about sanitary hospital conditions um, in which somebody might amputate something. Um, if, if you are sitting in, in, in some, some fetid jungle hut, you, you don't want to create open wounds if you want to keep a hostage alive. It's, it's, it's difficult enough to do so anyway. So the, the, the last thing you, you, you want is to endanger the, the operation altogether. And, 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 and also, if insurers know that there is a group that, that, that is ultra-violent, then, then the best way of dealing with them is, is not to pay a ransom, but to say, okay, these hostages are in mortal danger anyway. Um, they should no longer be considered as human shields. You might as well try a rescue operation. Yeah, going back to your friend in Colombia, um, that was so volatile a situation that it's worth risking the life of the hostage in a rescue mission. Anya, thank you for your time today. I really hope nobody listening ever actually needs this information. Indeed. That's what, what, I, what I hope too. But um, if somebody was in that situation and they suddenly feel that they've been deserted by their family and they've been deserted by their company and that the politicians don't care, it's not true. They care. They care deeply. Um, it is about creating a story that will manage the kidnappers' expectations to get them home as fast and as safely as possible without rewarding crime and creating all the moral baggage of um, buying your life at the expense of other people's safety.